Three, oh, Santa, Santa goes in there. He's a better manager than Postacoglu. Why does he's everybody Premier... rate Postacoglu so high? He chats shit in interviews. He's, he's big. Nah. He's, he's a big boy. He looks I different to everyone. He's not clean cut and all and that. Celtic have applied for exemption with UEFA for Yokohama Marinos boss Postacoglu. Was it Postacoglu? <laughs> where, did, where, did <laughs> where did they come up with these guys from? Ange Postacoglu has been written off throughout every chapter of his illustrious career. Despite coaching for close to three decades now, the Australian manager has constantly faced a barrage of criticism and belittlement. Yet time and time again, he has proven the doubters wrong with each achievement more incredible than the last. His journey to the top is unlike anything we've ever seen in football management. It's a roller coaster ride full of triumph, failure, and sheer adversity. This is the story of Ange Postacoglu. Born on the 27th of August 1965 in Athens, Greece, Ange's upbringing was complicated. At the time, the living situation within Greece was bleak, as political instability had destabilised the region. His father's business collapsed due to the Greek military's government overthrow. It was an unpleasant place to live. So at the age of five, Postacoglu and his family migrated to Australia by boat, finding solace in a vibrant Greek community in southeast Melbourne. As a kid, Ange was captivated by sport. Three sports, in fact. Football, cricket and AFL. You see, growing up in Australia in the 60s, football wasn't popular, and in Melbourne, AFL and cricket reigned supreme. Ange simply wanted to fit in and found sport to be a great common denominator. To this day, he still speaks very fondly of both codes, but it was football where he found his true purpose. Whether it be playing for a local club South Melbourne Hellas, watching it on TV into the early hours of the morning, or even reading popular football magazines, Ange couldn't get enough of the beautiful game. He started to rise through the ranks at South Melbourne as a talented attacking fullback, and it wasn't long before he was playing first team football in the NSL. This was the top division in Australia before the A-League came to fruition. By the way, his playing career doesn't get talked about enough. By the age of 21, he became club captain. He remained at South Melbourne for the entirety of his career, making 193 appearances, winning two championships, and was voted in the club's team of the century. Not bad, Ange, not bad. He also earned four senior caps for the Socceroos and had the privilege of working with ex-Real Madrid and Hungarian legend Ferenc Puskas, who was appointed South Melbourne manager in 1989. Puskas couldn't speak English, so Ange became his translator on and off the park as the pair communicated in Greek. Ange learnt a lot from Pushkas during their three years working together. He was in awe of the Hungarian's coaching philosophy and the attacking principles he stood by. After Pushkas left, Ange would play one more year before being forced into retirement at just 27 after suffering a knee injury. He immediately transitioned into the coaching realm, taking up the role of assistant coach at South Melbourne. Two years later, he was given the top job. It took time for the results to come, finishing third third in Ange's debut season, but success was just around the corner. The next two years were the most successful in the club's history, with Ange guiding South Melbourne to successive championships alongside an Oceania Champions League title. This triumph saw Ange's mighty South Melbourne then feature in the FIFA Club World Cup, facing the likes of treble winners Manchester United and South American champions Vasco da Gama. Now they did go on to lose these matches, but Ange's side performed admirably on both occasions. Shortly after, he would resign from South Melbourne to take up a new challenge within Australia, becoming manager of the Young Socceroos, working with both the U17s and U20s. During this time, he won all six Oceania Championship trophies and saw qualification to the World Cup on five out of six attempts. But in 2007, Australia failed to qualify for the first time in 18 years. This was a disaster, which was only amplified by an on-air argument with Australian football pundit Craig Foster. I think you should put your hand up and say, yep. in the last two qualification okay. campaigns, I've failed and I'm paid to do it. So you're saying I should resign? I think That's you should, your opinion. Yeah. Okay, so you've stated your opinion. Let's yeah. move on. This interview was calamitous for Ange. He was sacked months later, and his public image was completely tarnished within Australia. With no jobs on the horizon, he had to look far and wide for another coaching gig, eventually landing a role at Greek third division outfit Panasheki. It was his first taste of foreign management, but it wasn't exactly a fairy tale. Ange sought to guide the club back to the second tier and had taken them up to second place by January. But then a new investor joined the club, wanting to sign new players and even hire a replacement for Postacoglu. Out of principle, he resigned and returned back to Australia after only nine months. So once again, Ange was back in Australia 
and out of work. He'd make ends meet for the next few years, mostly by working as a football pundit whilst running coaching clinics on the side. He even landed another temporary coaching gig back in Victoria, joining Whittlesea Zebras, but it didn't work out, with Ange being unable to prevent the club from relegation. And so for Ange, it was once again back to the drawing board. A permanent media career now seemed most likely after three years out of a coaching role. But then something truly absurd happened. Brisbane Raw coach Frank Farina was caught drink driving on his way to training. This was his second drink driving offence in the space of two years, so Brisbane had no choice. He had to go. And within a matter of days, Ange got the call, he accepted, but also informed the owners that big changes were looming and to give him a full year before casting their final judgment. Now at the time, Brisbane had a fan base desperate for success. Since the inauguration of the A-League in 2004, the club hadn't won any silverware. So the fans weren't best pleased with the appointment of Ange as his reputation had taken a massive hit. His first few months in charge could only be described as chaotic. Ange wanted to completely change the culture within Brisbane, something that didn't exactly sit well with club captain and soccerroo Craig Moore, and vice captain Charlie Miller. Ange stood his ground and both players immediately left amongst many others. It seemed as though the club was falling apart internally and the results on the pitch were equally disastrous. They finished second bottom in the league, the worst season in the club's history. But Ange remained confident in his project and demanded a comprehensive overhaul to properly implement his philosophy. But no one could have foreseen what Ange was about to accomplish. The following season, he brought in a host of new players from around the globe. The likes of Thomas Broich, Eric Pardalou, Jean Carlos Solorzano, and Costa Barbarousis. These players completely transformed Brisbane Raw. They suddenly had become the league's best team, smashing their way to the league title, losing only one game all season, playing some of the best football ever witnessed in Australia. They were literally given the nickname Raw Salona in reference to Pep's Barca. Not a bad compliment. Those were the early glimpses of what we now know as Ange Ball. Anyways, they ended up winning the grand final that season in spectacular fashion, but Ange was only getting started. The next season, Brisbane continued to turn on the style, setting an Australian sporting record of 36 games unbeaten, a record that still stands today. Brisbane finished the regular season in second place, but won the grand final once again, becoming the first team to do so, and as a result, Ange was now Australia's most decorated coach with four titles to his name. In two and a half years, he had completely revolutionized Brisbane Brisbane into becoming the A-League's greatest ever team. But Ange was now itching for a new challenge. He therefore waved goodbye to Brisbane before taking the reins at hometown club Melbourne Victory. He once again went into rebuild mode, releasing eight key players, including Socceroos legend Harry Kuehl and Carlos Hernandez. He then brought in eight new recruits who were far more suited to his philosophy. But his decisions were justified once more. Melbourne improved on last year's performances to finish third in the league, a above Brisbane Raw, and more importantly, the playing style was supremely entertaining. It was an exciting time to be a Victory fan. But then a bombshell occurred. Holger Osik was sacked as Socceroos manager, with the FFA identifying Poster Koglu as the man to lead Australia moving forward. Ange hadn't completed his objectives with the Victory, but it was an offer he simply couldn't refuse. Ange became the first A-League coach to graduate to the Socceroos. That being said, he had a gargantuan task on his hands. They'd suffered successive six nil batterings at the hands of Brazil and France. This squad was in a bad place, and to make things worse, they were drawn into the literal group of death in the World Cup, facing previous finalists Spain and the Netherlands, and a fiercely talented Chile. The expectation was very low. Most managers would have opted for a more conservative approach to the vastly superior opposition, but Ange only knew one way, playing expansive, attack-minded football. Australia did ultimately walk away empty-handed in that World Cup, but remained competitive in all three games, including a World Cup classic match against the Netherlands. That Cahill volley, too good. They took the positives out of this tournament in the build-up to another major event, the 2015 Asian Cup. This tournament was a huge chance for Ange to create something special on home soil. They previously made the final back in 2011, but fell short to Japan, so the pressure was on Ange to deliver. The Socceroos won their opening two group games, but disappointingly lost in the third to South Korea.
Korea. In the quarters, they faced China and Timmy Cahill delivered the goods. They then breezed past the United Arab Emirates in the semis, leading to a highly anticipated rematch against South Korea in the final. Australia seemed destined to take home the trophy after Massimo Luongo's stunning opener, but Hyung Min Sun had other ideas, scoring a 90-second minute equaliser, meaning the match was headed for extra time. It was an intense situation, but an unbelievable piece of skill from Tommy Juric caught South Korea napping, James Troisi then took full advantage to score, and Australia went on to secure the Asian Cup title, their first major piece of global silverware. For Ange, he had cemented his legacy as an Australian coaching legend, a complete tactical and philosophical rejuvenation of the Socceroos. But soon after, the curtains would come crashing down on Ange once again. The next World Cup campaign was anything but smooth. The new generation of players lacked quality, and Ange became increasingly stubborn with his tactical decisions, despite the wayward results. The criticism was mounting, however Ange continued to stand firm in his choices, and eventually guided Australia to the World Cup Finals via the playoffs, by defeating Syria first, and then Honduras. But shortly after, rather than leading his nation into another World Cup, Ange surprisingly stood down from the job. It had been an incredible four years at the helm, but it was time for a new challenge and a return to club football. But where to next? Europe? Back in Australia? Nope. None other than Japan with Yokohama F Marinos. At the time, Yokohama were a sleeping giant. Partnered with the City Football Group, they were in a financially lucrative position, but simultaneously, they hadn't won a league title for 13 years. This was a massive opportunity for Ange, but it was uniquely difficult as well. Why? Because he didn't speak the language. A translator would be required not only for the Japanese players, but also for the foreign recruits too. And in his first season, he struggled to get his message across. The results were poor, at one point Yokohama were flirting with relegation, but he managed to salvage a 12th place finish, plus a cup final appearance as well. But in his second season, Ange did what Ange does best. He brought in nine new recruits who would completely transform Yokohama into an attacking machine. They stormed their way to the league title with a style of play that had never been witnessed in Japanese football. A fascinating tactical model that relied on inverted wingbacks, high pressing and intelligent moves. Movements. Ange Ball was in full swing. But in typical Ange fashion, he left at the height of the club's success, although it was for a good reason. A massive opportunity had arisen, the chance to become Celtic's next manager. This was a controversial appointment within Scotland. Understand Celtic were in a worrying predicament at the time. The season before last, they had won their ninth league title on the bounce, their fourth consecutive treble. But Steven Gerrard's Rangers put a sudden stop to their extended period of dominance, winning the league by a margin of 25 points. Celtic were in desperate need of a top manager to change the club's alarming trajectory. But this was the guy, a man who had never coached in Britain, and his only previous experience in Europe was a nine-month stint in the third tier of Greece. There was a general perception of who the hell is this bloke and what is he doing managing Celtic. But those who truly knew Ange understood what they were getting, a world-class manager. But in order to bridge the sizable gap between their bitter rivals ranges, an extensive rebuild would be required. Ange had grown a reputation previously for unearthing gems wherever he managed, but at Celtic, the recruitment was next level. The club added 17 new players that season from around the world. They went full pit bull. Mr. Worldwide! Signings from Russia, Israel, Poland, England, the Netherlands, Portugal, and most interestingly, Japan. Ange first brought in Kyogo Furuyashi from Vissel Kobe and added a further three J-League players later in the the January transfer window. The fans weren't particularly confident at first, these were a bunch of relatively unknown players, but it became apparent very quickly that Ange had cultivated a special group. The owners trusted Ange from the beginning and reaped the rewards. Their style of play had changed dramatically. Celtic were now playing glorious football. Ange ball, and more importantly, they were back to their winning ways. Now, during this period, Gerard had departed for Aston Villa, although Rangers were still a very strong team under Giovanni van Bronckhorst. He helped guide them all the way to the Europa League final, but they were no match domestically for Ange's 
Celtic. In his debut season in Scotland, Ange won the league title, becoming the first Aussie to do so in Europe. He also won the Scottish Cup, he won the Player of the Month award five times that season, and was also awarded the PFA Manager of the Year. To overturn a 25 point deficit in the space of one single season cannot be understated. And the signings he brought in. Kyogo had 20 goals, Giacomacus 17 goals, Abada 15 goals, Jota 13 goals, and people mocked this man's credentials but he still had sizable room for improvement. His second season would bring on even more success. He helped recruit further talent from relatively unknown leagues to make their squad even better, and the results were astonishing. A domestic treble, the Premiership, the League Cup, and the Scottish Cup, complete domination. This was some of the best football to ever grace Celtic Park. The fans were in constant awe of Big Ange and his footballing genius. Five trophies in just two years at the club, it was only a matter of time before he would be poached to an even bigger league for an even bigger challenge, none greater than the Tottenham job. The hiring of Ange was once again met with initial skepticism. Despite all of Ange's remarkable achievements thus far, there was still this naive sense of belittlement surrounding his appointment. Lazy pundits deemed Ange's success in Scotland to be unimpressive, that anyone could replicate that, and at a club like Tottenham, he would struggle to achieve any success whatsoever. Granted, I can understand the pessimism to an extent. After all, Tottenham had haven't won a trophy in 15 years, despite hiring some big name managers in the past, and the reality was that Ange wasn't the club's first choice. Tottenham's number one target was actually Julian Nagelsmann. So for those who didn't have a full grasp of Ange's credentials, it's easy to see why he was written off from the get-go. But for Ange, this was nothing new. He was fully aware of the mammoth challenge ahead. His first task as Spurs boss was a cultural reset. The last three managers at the club had a fundamentally different playing style. The likes of Mourinho and Conte were heavily focused on defensive counter-attacking football. This is not Ange. His philosophy is guided by attacking principles. It didn't help that Tottenham lost their iconic talisman in Harry Kane to Bayern, but in fairness to Spurs, they were relatively ambitious with their own recruitment. Dejan Kulusevski and Pedro Porro were purchased on a permanent basis. They brought in Gielmo Vicario from Empoli, a more technically sound goalkeeper. Defensively, they added Mickey van der Ven from Wolfsburg, a tailor-made defender for the Premier League, and in midfield and attack, top signings. James Madison was brought in from relegated Leicester for 40 mil. He's been incredible. Manuel Solomon joined on a free transfer. Alio Veles was purchased from Rosario, one to look out for in the future. And on deadline day, Brennan Johnson signed for just under 50 mil. Over 200 million pounds spent, not bad for Daniel Levy. So a new club, a new rebuild, but same old Ange. Tottenham are already starting to witness the success of Ange Ball. The football has been superb. Tottenham are yet to lose in the Premier League as of the 30th of September and have put in some sublime performances thus far. Granted, they did bow out of the Carabao Cup very early, which will be disappointing for Spurs fans considering they are crying out for silverware of any sort. But for Ange, this might be a blessing in disguise. Spurs look promising, but they aren't the finished article by any means. Their squad depth is not at the level of their elite competitors, so having one sole focus till January is ideal for Ange. One thing that has been fascinating to see, however, is the media's rapid shift in perception towards Ange. No longer is he being ridiculed, but rather universally appreciated. The football has been first class, but what makes Ange so likable, so charismatic, are his qualities as a man. Every word that comes out of his mouth resonates with people. Even Arsenal fans don't have a bad thing to say about him. That speaks volumes about his character. His press conferences have become captivating. He just gets it. You hear the Spurs players speaking of his influence and it's clear to see he is creating something genuinely special. Now it won't happen overnight. Despite the swift improvements, Spurs are still a long way away from becoming a great team. But if history has taught us anything, it's that Ange is destined to succeed long term. He is a proven winner with the utmost experience in football management. This guy was literally coaching years before Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho and Jurgen Klopp. Now as an Australian, I mean may be slightly biased in my overall assessment, but the accolades tell you everything you need to know. It's been a crazy career thus far, full of euphoric highs and soul-crushing lows, but the journey has been nothing short of spectacular. 27 years dedicated to an unforgiving profession, yet at 58, it feels as though Ange Postacoglu's managerial story has only just begun, and I can't wait for the next chapter.